Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Transport Tavern. Are we all all right today? Um, right. I know Barry's here. Hello, Barry. Could you possibly just tell us if you can hear us, Barry? Or somebody else or anybody else? Anybody out there? I think it takes a while for it to uh, come through to the feed. So. Hello now. Ah, thank you. And uh, ignored ambience. That's that's great. And Mike, so no. you you hear us both. That's fantastic. Uh, can I can I say a quick hello to Tom then, who's just joined us? As yeah. Ignored ambient. Yeah. One of, one of the project volunteers, which is lovely. Oh, great. Hello, hello, welcome. So, um, I think I think we should. Uh, get going um hello everybody welcome to the transport tavern i hope you're having a, a good day um i'm very very pleased to welcome my good friend colleague collaborator external examinator examinator <laughs> uh like and all round good wonderful chat dr mike Espester. hello mike oh, that staring introduction i don't think i can live up to it but that is very kind of you oh and, and if you could just tell everybody, what's your what's your background? What 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 where where did you start as a railway historian? Um, so long term interest in railways, which I think is probably common to many, if not all of us. And I was fortunate enough, also wider interest in history. So I did history as an undergraduate degree, and was fortunate enough to be able to follow up with the masters and PhD in railway studies at York. Um, which was how you and I, David, initially met on that, that side of things. So the York connection is a strong one. Um, and been fortunate enough to carry it on as an academic career now down at the University of Portsmouth. Okay, that's, yeah, I mean, we've, we've actually got quite similar trajectories, haven't we, in, in some sense, um, uh, up to our, PA, you know, our history and PhD, same, you know, same supervisor. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um what we'll do is we'll we'll crack on. Hello, everybody. Oh, we've got loads of people in. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Gareth. Hello, Dave. How, how are we all doing? Gunnar, Polly. Yeah, all of you. Sorry if I've missed anybody. Uh, welcome. Um, so firstly, we, we're in the tavern, and we're going to talk about our beer. So, Mike, York Brewery. Yep, thank you very much. Well, again, this is the York Connection coming out from uh, happy memories of time in, in York and uh, trips around the brewery and drinking their produce, uh, their tied houses in York. Uh, drinking uh, Guzzler, which is a nice golden golden session ale, um, citrusy, um, so very very drinkable. And depending on how we go, hopefully I may move on to the, the Minster Ale, which is a bit stronger. Um, got a bit hoppier, mm -hmm. uh, but, and named after, of course, the iconic York Minster. Well, I, I'm drinking a uh, session IPA uh, by the Pretty Decent Brewery, and uh, uh, they they're a, a North London brewery. Um, and as I said, we we're, we're on we're we're doing this with breweries so we can support local breweries, local business, and small business. Uh, and this one is definitely worth supporting because every penny or every uh every sale they make they donate something to water charities um that uh helps fund sustainable solutions uh or this is what I said uh to and access to safe water and sanitation around the world so that is very lovely very nice hoppy west coast ipa so on with the show so mike this is your title screen sort of yeah thank you yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just I asked if Dave could put this on in ahead of time. One of the, the key things I was hoping to do this evening is for anyone who hasn't run across the Railway Work Life and Death Project yet um, to just raise some awareness about it and give you the details you need to come and find us uh, via the website or uh, on Twitter. So there you go. That's us. I'll be saying more about what we're up to in a moment. Yes. Yeah, so let's crack on. So, Mike, you, you pop this. Oh, I've got to make you a bit bigger there. Uh, we got a we got a thanks. You, your first slide is thanks. 
yeah absolutely so usually we get to the end of a session and we do the thank you very much and actually i wanted to start with that because one of the key things about the project is that it's only possible because of the work of the volunteers uh, at least one of whom tom is here this evening which is lovely and uh again gordon i think it's probably gordon dudman possibly yes, it is yeah who has uh, volunteered brilliant hi to gordon thank you very much for everything including the blog post that you sent me recently which we'll be putting up soon um that's great so it's it's thanks to people like tom like gordon like all of the volunteers who got involved in the project that were able to do what we're doing i'll say a little bit more about some of the volunteers and the work they're doing as we go along um, but i wanted to start off by recognizing them as as really the the engine house behind what we're doing so the most important people in it uh but also thanks to my project co-leads uh, karen baker at the National Royal Museum and Helen Ford at the Modern Record Centre, again, who do a tremendous amount of work with what we're doing. And uh, to recognise again the, the contribution that Chris Heather at the National Archives is making in the work that he and the volunteers there are doing with us. Um, so that's you know, great thanks to them and, of course, the institutional support that we have from the National Railway Museum, the Modern Record Centre, the National Archives and my institution, the University of Portsmouth. And finally, of course, thank you to everyone who's come on this evening. Yeah, day. well, yes, absolutely. It, it's it's a really good, it, it's a really collaborative project that sort of enables lots of people to get involved. And, and you know, you've made all those connections, haven't you? And it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a broad base of support, shall we say. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, again, I'll say something a bit about that collaborative nature, because that is really important to I think partly to the project, partly to me, and and hopefully to all who are involved mm. in it, that it, it should be collaborative in that way. Can we uh, um, crack on with the let's press yeah, first slide, if I can get it to, there we go. Okay, great stuff. So if we're thinking about the railways, I think quite often it's very easy to think about the, the hardware, the big things, uh, which of course the system it doesn't exist without them. You can't mm. get by without them. Um, so here we've got uh, London Northwestern Express uh, 1913 uh, charging through at speed. Not quite sure of the location. Uh, this one image has come from the Railway was Museum. Was she troughs, probably? Uh, could, possibly? Yeah, that's quite possibly so. Yes, you can see some yeah. troughs uh, in the, the foreground there. Um, but there's something missing from this picture. And David, if you whiz on to the next slide. Indeed. There we go. It's the people. Of course, there's the crew on the train that we still can't see, but I'd, yes, unfairly perhaps I'd cropped that or edited that photo so that we didn't see the, the permanent way gang uh, hard at work there in the background, uh, just beyond the running lines in this case, or the fast lines in this mm. case. So, again, this is a real reminder of, of where the project has come from, which is it's, it's about the people. Mm. Um, the system cannot operate without the people then as now and in the future yeah. so if we're looking at, at the railway network the railway system uh, as kind of the big things then we're we're missing the picture if we're not including the people that that make it work totally. um so if we could go on to the next slide yeah. where is it ah oh. okay, elements so of railway work absolutely i'm not going to say anything in in vast detail about these other than that these have come from the National Railway Museum and this slide and the next are just a couple of images of railway work that have been captured over the years. Uh, some of the, the various elements that go into it as a reminder that, as I'm sure we all know, the railways were huge employers and they employed a very diverse workforce in all sorts of roles and occupations. Um, so from those who are doing really dirty work, cleaning out the um ash pits at the engine sheds um i think we've got a barman emerging from a firebox there having cleaned it out um those who were involved in the shunting so bottom right as we look at it um, i mean that that's and, one of the sort of unique features of railway work it, it, it the railway industry it had everything from clerical workers right right down to machinists right you know there's there's sort of almost every type of you know what I mean? It's so diverse in the work yeah. types. Absolutely. And in fact, you're quite saying that. I'm Thank you for saying that, because you just reminded me that what I focused on how it tends to be, it's, it's the manual roles and those that are actually physically at work 
on the rails. Now, as you say, it's not only the, the clerical workers and those who are in kind of static roles behind the scenes. So in the laundries, say in the, the factories doing uh, sempstresses or, or what have you, um, but there are those connected with the shipping concerns, uh, the road concerns, so uh, draymen and so on, later motor drivers, and by the time you get into 30s, uh, those connected with the air side of, of what the railways are doing. So Hoteliers and, and, and also once you get, of course, to the, you know, the post-war period thomas cook is part of the british transport commission so there's sort of tourist agents and yeah it's real mix isn't it yeah absolutely and, and as uh, david i think some of the work you've been looking at in terms of promotion of of overseas travel foreign travel you know the the agents that they had overseas in the states and other other countries for example so yeah huge huge diverse workforce um the only thing i say about the final thing I say about this this image is the top left image uh, taken in Doncaster in 1943. Um, so again, very unusual in many respects in terms of conditions, wartime conditions, but the riveters at work are mm. women. Um, so again, just to, to kind of make sure that we're, we're recognising all of the roles and uh, people who have been involved in the railways over the years. Um, if you can go on to the next slide, David, please. Four roles. Absolutely. So again, we got um, just a bit of that variety. So from the, the dock side, uh, top left, which is Garston, 1913, unloading bananas, the image caption tells me. Um, I'd love to know about the, that supply we, chain, of course. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, and then uh, women cleaners in the First World War, uh, down to the factory uh, as a workshop um, which da, 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 uh, I think it's crew um, and bottom left it's it's not easy to see on this one but uh, this is uh, Wilsden in 1915 uh, tow roping so the engine which is slightly well, you see the tender slightly forward of the wagons uh, if you'll notice the points have been changed between the engine moving and the wagons moving uh, the wagons are being towed there's a rope between the tender yeah. and the wagons that it's going to Move the I didn't realise it happened that late. Yeah, absolutely. We're still, and again, this is one of the things that's coming out of the project work is that we're seeing these accidents that relate that come from acts like this still going on. So it's uh, you know fly shunting as well, and all all sorts. Um, is it a local practice that probably shouldn't be going on, or I uh, too hard. This is again. It's no, this is one of the really interesting things that's coming out of the project is what, and again, I will say something about this later, is what we're getting is that sense of local practices, but also occasionally you do get glimpses of where they've been sanctioned by certainly the local hierarchy, or, you know, at least in terms of turning a blind eye. Um, so this, you know, there are all sorts of elements that are really interesting that are coming out of this, this sort of source, which is perhaps unexpected. Um, yeah. So... Well, I was going to say, yes, please. Uh, so what's what's the problem? We've seen some of the railway work. Uh, accidents, OK, always a big problem. No one wants them. Not great. Um, however, when people tend to think about railway accidents to this day as well, we, I think Uh, so in this case, uh, the Thorpe accidents uh, near Norwich in 1874, where two trains uh, collided head on. Uh, obviously not ideal. 25 people died, 75 injured. And as was befitting of the press of the time, they come up with this kind of melodramatic depiction. Um, the dead and injured being pulled from the wreckage. Uh, needless to say, it's the, the helpless women being pulled out as well. Uh, just to kind of give it that extra sense of, of pathos uh, for the Victorian middle class readership. Um, this one from the Illustrated London News. Um, uh, you know, there's no denying that, that these events are tragic and uh, all those killed and injured, you know, terrible for them, their families, friends, communities. Absolutely. But they're spectacular and they're, they're exceptional. They were then, they are now, which is one of the reasons, of course, why they're so um, uh, so kind of so heavily covered in the press, which does give us great sources, but is perhaps kind of 
pushed us in a dip. So railway accidents have been a sort of public discourse in from the 18... Well, what, Huskinson got run over, uh, but... You know, from the 1860s, 50s, 60s, Dickens' work and, and stuff like that, it really becomes, it's only really a much, isn't it, that the the concern for railway workers from about the late 1880s really comes onto the scene, would you say, or and is it a bit earlier? Um, well, no, no, I would say it's about then. So the there's one of the challenges is that it emerges in the kind of later 1880s, really 1890s, and it's in relation to passengers. So the first... Uh, the first air, real area of concern is the hours of work of uh, footplate crew and signalmen, uh, because they're the people who are going to make a mistake, by and large, uh, that endangers the passengers. So it's kind of, there's a concern for the workers, but it's really because it's concern for the passengers. Yeah. It's not until you get a bit later on, so uh, in the late 1890s, that there's there's a bit of public concern again and then it kind of tails off there's a bit more before the first world war and then it basically kind of disappears by and large that, is that can you could you tie that to any others should we say broader concerns over you know in, in the in the public sphere generally over say mine workers is, is it happening at the same time as as other sort of public health concerns about industrial relations and, and you know, it's not industrial relations but industrial safety uh, I mean, it, it is industrial relations as well, because well, um, yes, you know, course, particularly yeah. in other industries, there are strikes that relate to safety and it becomes more obvious. And uh, in other industries, you know, you get the, the match girls in terms of fossy jaw and the, the rise of new unionism. So there's uh, there are wider concerns and there are links to other industries. Absolutely. And of course, the unions um, starting off in the 1870s and uh, 1880s on the railways and any strength are you know, do campaign for safety, do try and raise awareness, trying to get uh, railwaymen, and they were all men in at this point in terms of MPs, uh, elected officials, to raise these issues in Parliament. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of really complicated issues about why why safety becomes an issue when it does and for how long. Um, it, kind of, it, it flares up and disappears because for, for workers, the accidents happen, as they do to this day, in ones, maybe twos most usually out of sight of people they're not spectacular they're fairly mundane by and large you know it's sad to say but uh, a worker being hit by a train uh, someone uh, ending up with a, a limb in a piece of moving machinery um, a shunter getting uh, fingers trapped between buffers you know it's, it's some of it is very small scale stuff but it mounts up and if if you go on to the next slide we can get some impression of the numbers. So the, the numbers are, I'm always a bit sceptical about this, absolute numbers. They tell us something. They tell us how many people have been killed or injured. Um, a bundle to kill deaths and injuries into the same graph here. Um, it's uh, By the time you get to the First World War, you're looking at kind of upper 400s being killed a year, which is an incredible number. Um, and the rest being injuries. So the vast majority are injuries, and the vast majority of those are relatively small injuries. But we've still got, you know, 1913, we've got nearly 30,000 people being killed or injured in a single year. That's that's an awful lot of bodies. So firstly, I'll say, if anybody's got any questions, I am monitoring the chat, so just mm. please ask away. I'm happy to relay questions or, you know. Please. Um, but We've got two, should we say, jumps there. We've got one around 1907, and then we've got slightly smaller scale. Is there any reason? Is that a report, reporting, a recording change, or is it...? Yeah, it's a it's a statistical artefact. Um, they change the way that accents are reported in both of those years. So it, yeah, this is... This is why I say these are kind of these are absolute numbers, but even then they're not. It's not necessarily fair. What I think we're likely to see, they they change a the period um, that that by in which a, a company so companies legally have to report accidents, which is what gives us our source base, which is or one of our source bases, which is brilliant. Um, but the period of, uh, it's only after an employee has been off for a certain length of time. Right. So they change it in 1895 to take effect 1896 and again 1906 for 1907. So uh, I now I have to say I've forgotten the, the length uh, at which someone had to be off work before it was reportable. It might have been a week initially. Yeah. 
which basically knocked out all of the minor injuries and some of the bigger ones. Um, and uh, I think they dropped that to three days and I forget what they did in the, the, the subsequent change. Um, but but either way, yeah, it's, what I'd say to that is uh, what you're looking at, kind of the latter end after 1907, you're probably looking at the same sort of level of injuries that would have happened all along. It's just they weren't being reported before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the, the, the work, I recall, shrinks a little bit in this period. Um, Economies and, and stuff like that, If I re- it's still about 650,000 people, roughly. Yes, that's it. I was going to say by by the turn of the, by the time of the first world war, well, nineteen thirteen, you're looking at about six hundred forty thousand uh, employees. So it's you know, it is a sizable workforce. There's no doubt about it. One of the biggest as a as a sector in the UK. Um, so we've got large numbers of casualties. If you flick on briefly to the next one, so now we've got some breakdown of 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 what they are, how they are. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is more just a kind of the large numbers. Um, like what's going on at the moment with with COVID, just the, the sheer scale of the numbers is difficult to grasp. Um, seeing something like this, it it may provide some kind of a, a different handle on it. This is only a small sample. Uh, it's what the Board of Trade, the state railway inspectors, uh, the the accidents they investigated. So it's just under four thousand cases in between 1911 January 1911 and June 1915 so even even so you've got a fair number uh, oh spoiler alert everyone uh, the, the cat's out of the bag here um there you go sorry Great. Lovely. Well, actually, um, so again, this even something like this, I think, doesn't necessarily help us in terms of it tells us something. We get kind of this visual record of lots of people. Um, however, what we still lose sight of in this is that these are all individuals that are being hurt, being killed in some way. So if you do flick on to the next slide, which you had a quick flick on, um, this is a tiny, tiny sample of uh, the Great Eastern Railway staff who were killed at work. Uh, they quite, not unusually, but I, I find it interesting that they did this. They printed a little portrait and a short summary of the individual. I mean, we are talking, you know, 50 words uh, in the company magazine. So company magazines, as always, a brilliant source uh, for all sorts of reasons. But give us just to ask because i did a i can't i did a i looked at i did an article for rail on the on the on the epidemic 1918 Mm. one thing that struck me and i wonder if you found this is that you'll get a situation where you have somebody who's noted in a newspaper as passing away because of the pandemic but it doesn't turn up in the great eastern railway magazine which is digitized from the great eastern railway society people just so you know is it a case that who goes into the magazine is some is in somewhat self-selecting in that their family might put them forward or somebody knows someone how well that's a really interesting question i don't know I, the, the magazine so i relied heavily on the great western railway magazine for my phd and looking into the kind of the mechanics of it it was it was extremely difficult to find anything out about how it functioned really you know it's clear that they had stuff being contributed by employees uh it was clear that some stuff was being commissioned by the editor but beyond that that sort of detail i don't know but that is a great question um i because I, 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 I get the sense of that i get the sense from the southwesterns one they listed everybody but that it was very corporate in that it was started by a clerical worker i know the great western you said that in one of your papers the great western was edited by somebody who was close to the general manager's office mm-hmm. uh i think it's the same with the southwestern I th- I think it's the same probably for for most if not all in that they even if they start off kind of as staff organs that they mm. they are useful for promoting company identity um, within the company but also actually within the, you know they are read beyond the railway employees as well by the public in some cases um, so yeah they they're a useful thing for the companies which is why it's a bit interesting that they and again the great eastern wasn't alone in in doing this later on the southern railway magazine do the same thing 
um, about printing details and in this case images of workers who've been killed in accidents you kind of think that's the sort of thing they wouldn't be saying much about but I think it's partly about that that um, kind of the imagined community to uh, pinch Bennett Jansen um, for, for this purpose but you know about making links across the system and for those because obviously workers are moving around a lot um, as part of their roles so or some workers are some grades are so people in other bits of the system may know them um, and want to find out about them so I suspect that's that's it um, but again it's weren't a particularly good employee they might not I mean there's an editorial decision there isn't there so yes yeah absolutely and it's it's again it's quite interesting thinking about this in terms of just thinking that uh, Gareth Dennis last week was talking a bit about the railway family and with you obviously um, and you know this, this is something that the company magazines are good at and I, I did have a, I was curious about the, the case in the middle here FJ Ellis and GA Fisher because there's, there's, there's two of them together um, with all the others are individual cases I thought well it's something you know it's this has got both of them whatever it is there isn't masses of detail about them um other than that they were both killed in an incident at Ilford uh on the 13th of January 1913 um but it, again it, it talks a little bit about the funeral and saying that it was well attended by their colleagues um some of whom were the coffin bearers mm. pool bearers. so again thinking about that kind of that's probably why they featured that because it was you know seen as a notable uh, company funeral despite the fact that it was it was company work that that had killed them and I, so, I, I think you 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 kind of get that thing when you, you see it when you've got senior officers as well they they have a similar sort of to a higher level with you know everybody attended x many hundreds of people attended the funeral it's that sense of community it's that sense of so these two chaps probably you know they were particularly known around and you know it's worth while reporting for editorial decisions uh, about who is worthy of inclusion uh, in this um so just to, to kind of uh, i suppose the, the preamble to that or the, to, to what comes next is that the, the broad point of the project is to try and make this kind of granular fine level of detail more accessible so that we can find out about the people rather than just know about the numbers um so to the next one please do yes so we're dealing with a whole bunch of sources um now in terms of background to to that um i became aware of the sources and this uh, type of source in particular whilst i was doing my phd um but i didn't have time to draw on it uh, to any in any level of detail because there were so many of these reports so i mean we're talking i think uh we're looking at probably for the, the from the state accident investigations uh maybe twenty thousand reports across 1900 to 1939 so there's there's large numbers of these things uh full of information um full of detail that could be useful to all sorts of people but at the moment basically inaccessible they're not indexed in any way the except in a couple of cases uh, you need to go to visit uh, an archive to get access to anything that's that's contained within them um so it's a tremendous resource and it's got a tremendous amount of detail for all sorts of things in it but it's it's locked up so one of the hopes of the project was very much to to make this sort of thing more accessible to to make sure that people know about it know about the people involved but also start using it for their research for their interest um, to find out a bit more so we started off um, in 2015 at a uh, it's a joint conference between the Rao Museum the National Rao Museum and um, a, a family history organization and that proved to be kind of the, the kickoff point. I go, came along, gave a paper, and said, look, we've got these records. Can we do something with them? Would people be interested in, in a kind of crowdsourcing project a la Zooniverse, um, which for those who are not familiar is, uh, is fantastically interesting, um, basically taking pictures of, from things like the Hubble Space Telescope and making them available to people and say, right, can you find any new galaxies in there? Uh, and training people a bit on how to do it, and they do it remotely at home. 
Um, and it's they've you know people Joe Public, Josephine Public have discovered thousands of, of new universes that would have taken donkey's years for, for the astronomers to do and it's something that, again machines aren't good at doing so kind of thinking about that can we do something similar in history in the arts and humanities disciplines and so i put this to the the conference and it got a favorable response from from the mixture of people that were present family historians railway historians academics archivists and said okay well how do we make this happen so fortunate that one of the organisers of the conference, Jackie DePel, um, was very enthusiastic. She's brilliant um, and she's, she's great uh, within the family history and genealogy community. Um, and she said, right, OK, let's do this. We've had some discussion with her, worked with the Railway Museum. The Railway Museum were keen to do this. They had a team of volunteers that were just coming to the end of a previous project. So we had the right timing, which is always crucial. You know, the stroke of luck there. Um, and said, right, well, can we can we make this happen? So we did this this trial run using this sort of, of document um, and the idea was that, that volunteers would, we were able to make these available to the volunteers, they would uh, effectively transcribe what's in the document. So there's all sorts of details, where the accident happened, when, including the time of day in some cases, who, what their role was, their age in some cases, not always, how long they've been on duty and a description of the accident and who the inspector thought was was responsible. Um, so there's, there's loads in there for all sorts of interest and thought right if we get this done could this work as a project uh, could we you know methodology and it, it did the, the NRM volunteers have been absolutely fantastic so they started in 2016 and many of that same team are still with us through several iterations of the project work later um, currently doing more of this this stuff and it's great to hear from them when they say actually we're learning more about what was going on on the railways in practice um, so we're getting stuff from it we're taking cases and researching them um, and coming up with they keep coming back to me with ideas about oh what about this how can we explain that which is brilliant some stuff I can explain some stuff I really can't <laughs> um, yeah. but then you know that's the whole point of stuff like this which is 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 great um, so for this, we've got kind of a decent chunk of records. The, um, so I said about 20,000 accidents covering 1900 to 1939 with a gap for the First World War. Uh, but that was only about 3% of the total number of accidents. Yeah. So there were only two inspectors, accident inspectors initially, bumped up to uh, by another three in, I think, 1905. Um, but, you know, five inspectors to investigate you know, 10 12, 20,000 accidents, uh, it doesn't go a long way. So we've got, you know, we've got a great source base, but it's only a small part of the total. Sense there that it, you're not, you're not capturing all the accidents that happen. No. And one of the, one of the questions that people, volunteers and others keep coming back to me on is, uh, well, how did inspectors choose which ones to investigate? I couldn't tell you. Um, you know, it's it's clear that all the accidents are details about them are sent into the the centre, and so to the to the rail inspectorate, and then the inspectors there somehow make a decision about uh, which ones they're going to go investigate. I suspect that kind of that skews things as well. So there's a bit of a national perspective on this that of our initial sample of nearly four thousand cases, just just over three thousand nine hundred, um, about two thousand eight hundred of them were in England. So I think closer to London and more investigated. 700, I think, odd were in Scotland, about 230 in Wales and 100 and... Interesting to look at the sort of geographical dispersal of it, actually, to see, you know, GIS even, you know, to make it... Well, absolutely, yeah. Funny enough, I've been working with some colleagues at Portsmouth, um, Humphrey Sutherland and Paul Olcott um, of the GB1900 team, and through some of their colleagues, they've uh, they've lent us the GIS data for uh, the the net railway network um, that they put together. So I just now need to find a way to put the accidents together with that data. So it's which is beyond my technical capability, believe you me. But it's it's a long term hope for what we can do for exactly this reason, because again, visually, spatially recognizing it and then um, making it accessible, I think will really help uh, people get into it. So I should also, could I, before we go on, I should say this, there's um, one of the key roles about the NRM volunteers has been um, 
Craig Shaw, who's a volunteer himself, but he basically he kind of takes care of the DNRM's volunteer team, and he's been absolutely essential, a linchpin of the project um, since since its start uh, in terms of getting data out to volunteers back in, doing some of the data cleaning, fielding queries, and uh, working with me and Karen at the NRM on on this side of things. So he's been absolutely brilliant. So I should recognise him uh, specifically. But now. Let's, um, let's we, we, we have a question to do with from Ooh, Barry yeah. to do with roping in anything in the rule book. Well, um, uh, funny enough, it's, there might there might be something about not doing it in the rule book. I think that there's uh, I would have to go and check. And at the moment, my copy of David, I think it was last week you had your copy of the, the Great Westerns 1904 rule book. Um, many, many rule books. Yeah, yes. my, my copy of the uh, Copies of the rule book are currently locked in my office um, at work, not here, uh, inaccessible. So couldn't check mm. off the top of my head. But I have a feeling that this will be a kind of there are permissive bits in it which say you shouldn't tow rope uh, unless there's no other means of doing it. So there's always kind of a, a sneaky get out clause there, which it's, again, it's really interesting to see how these are used and how the trades unions in particular complain about that because they basically say well you at least turn a blind eye to people doing this except when there's an accident and inquiry at which point you bring out the rule book and say oh you shouldn't do it mm -hmm. so there's there's a kind of a, a power battle as always involving the rule book that that um the unions and others get very concerned about cool well we'll, we'll, we'll go to rule books barry and see if you know it might maybe yeah, in the appendices somewhere on those local local practices yes yeah no that is true and again think about um uh, yes yeah, specific circulars for stations or locations that may come into play so it's kind of there's a bigger there's lots of, of bits that we need to look at to to get a kind of a picture again whether or not it's prohibited doesn't mean say it didn't take place as we find out from these reports so if we if we go on again i I just wanted to include sight of a couple of these uh, so trade union records from the Modern Records Centre at the University of Warwick. Um, and again, a big thank you to the, the volunteers there, the team there, Helen Ford, um, who's the, the co-lead, and James King, who's been helping as well. Um, the, we're working with data or cases that were um, documented by the, I'm going to get this wrong way around, uh, the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants. <laughs> which went on to become the NUR, um, so National Union Railwaymen, and now the RMT, of course. Um, you know, obviously, they had a, a big interest in health and safety and in protecting the interests of their members. So, again, we've got a kind of particular subset of the population, the railway population involved, um, but we've got uh, some good records of a number of things, often financial, although the top image we can see here is from the... Uh, legal book that covered 1901 to 1905 that if i say i may come back to later if i have, have any time left um but again it was it was about in legal cases where the union represented its members and a great many of them were accidents um but the the sorts of things where there's a financial payout is important to the unions to make sure the members are getting the benefits they're entitled to some of those come from the union so things like uh, death benefits. So every time a member died, whether it's accident, ill health, old age, whatever, they got a five pound payout. Um, but other other things were disablement claims, um, compensation, non-fatal compensation, fatal compensation. So again, holding the companies to account um, in in many respects to this. Um, they also represented members at uh, inquests, coroner's inquests and uh, Board of Trade inquiries or Ministry of Transport later inquiries and uh, the, the kind of the I think the saddest record uh, again is and it's material that we're bringing into the project the volunteer team there are working on um, is uh, from the Orphans Fund so it's you know it details the number of dependents that are being paid out on uh, whether it's one two three four five in some, some cases six children who are under the age of I'm going to say 13, it might have been 14, um, which is kind of the cutoff point for, for being in cover, included under this. Um, and yeah, it just gives you that bit more 
insight into the after effects of the accident again that wider the family the people that are involved which is yeah it's very very sad um so we've got a, a small but dedicated team at the modern record center um five volunteers who are doing fantastic work plowing through an immense amount of data this is the early these are the earlier records we've got so starting in 1889 um we'll come up to the the second world war hopefully um but it's going to take some time and again i may say something about that later because we've got uh, got hopes and plans to involve more people so listeners be aware i shall come <laughs> you'll be uh, putting out a call will you absolutely yeah as, as we get towards the end of this what i um, what i find is really interesting about that sort of that bottom document is i, I was looking at it, i was thinking okay so date joined you've got people who joined 1876 which must be some of the, the first members of the union and the chap uh, was it uh, D. T. Herberts who joined in 1876 and died in 1918, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you got someone who you know joined joined in 1915 and then died in 1980. Is there any? Would there, if you know, would the amount the claim be relative to how long they were in the union? So um, no, it's not. It's a, a for the death claims. It's a flat five pound payout. At this point in time, so 1918, um, it's yeah, it's not dependent on service. There are some things which there's a an eligibility um, requirement on. I suspect one of those will be the orphans fund. So you had to be paying it. That was a separate uh, fund to pay into. So you had to be paying in for a set length of time before any form of payout. Um, and I'm trying to think whether there's anything that's, that's dependent on the length of service or anything like that. I don't think there was, um, but yeah. So. Um, great. So again, just to, to get a sense of the sorts of records that we're looking at. So we've got some manuscript, some uh, some typed. Uh, if we go on to the, the next slide, please. So again, I'm not expecting anyone to read the detail here, um, although interest, this is one that we saw the uh, the state report on earlier. So, oh, MT right. Harris. so yeah, these are linked together. Um, and so what's what's quite nice about this in some respects, this is the company's record of it that you do you get a bit more detail than is in the state accident report both about what happened also about um what then happens to uh the the employee so uh, of the i've this is these are massive volumes i mean some of them are a couple of feet wide uh you know, a couple of feet in each direction so they're, they're absolutely <laughs> yeah, they're, i've seen some for the southwest and they are hefty yes yeah yeah absolutely so it, trying to get an image so i spliced a couple of bits of, of image here together so on the lower half of the the image um in the the second column from the left you've got a string of payments 1914 through to 1920 uh again part of the compensation um he lost a leg uh right leg amp uh, amputate lost below the the knee um and then in what's interesting about this one is that you get some uh, a little bit of a the next column over to the right you get a kind of bit of a statement about his, his later career what they what happened to him and eventually that he died I think of an unrelated ill health uh issue 1920 so you know if it's not bad enough losing losing part of your leg anyway heart you, disease it's kind of still, yeah. yeah so it's but again it's it's that what happens next so by putting the different sources together we get kind of useful different different bits of the picture different things um which flesh out the story um in some respect i should also say one while i say again um very grateful to all of the national archives volunteers who are working with us on this uh, as I mentioned tom who's with us this evening uh is one of them and has been doing great work again he's another one who's been coming to us with questions and saying what about this and kind of again really starting to interrogate the data which is, is brilliant it's, it's just what we, we'd hoped would happen um quite nice that um uh, kind of thinking of this as a, a family affair my cousin is one of the national archives transcribers for the project um so it's it's quite funny that she's ended up doing this uh, as well um so the whole point of this what's what's happening people are the volunteers are uh, looking at these records transcribing the data into a spreadsheet uh which is standardized so we can then search the data much more easily and make it available much more easily to people uh, which is what we've been doing through the project website 
Um, so that's the, kind of the key thing. Um, as I say, it's been great working with the with the volunteers uh, who are doing more than just transcription, um, but the investigation side of things. So the heads, you know, David, you opened up by saying about the the crowdsourcing, the collaborative um, ideal behind this, and, and that's where it comes in. That it, it should be a two way process. We've really benefited from the knowledge and expertise of uh, those who come from a railway background, either you know, detailed railway knowledge or from the railway industry itself. And I mentioned Gordon earlier, you know, he's come from the railway industry. He's another one of those people who's always feeding us useful tidbits of information about, well, this is how it works in practice in my day. Some of it is very much recognisable from our records, some of it not. Uh, that's fascinating. You know, we learn so much from, from these other people uh kind of i'm an academic i have a particular way of approaching it uh I, you know, a particular expertise if you wish but the uh people coming from the railway industry have a particular expertise people coming from the railway interests have a particular expertise the family historians have been fabulous you know it's really interesting both those who are helping us with the project uh, as volunteers and as kind of transcribing volunteers and the family historians who've been getting in touch with us and sharing the cases in their family histories What's been great is when they've said, oh, we found a case uh, at my, you know, my great grandfather in, in the records that you made available. This is what we know about his wider life, what happened to his family after his accident and so on. And that's again, that, that bigger picture is brilliant. Um, so, yes. Oh, actually, I think if you go on to the next slide, um, which, there we go. There, there was the thanks. Thanks again. Um, so yes. I've just I've covered this one. So, you know, uh, I mentioned many people. Um, Stuart, one of the volunteers with me down at Portsmouth, is uh, brilliant. Uh, my father has been helping out with this as well, so thanks, Dad. Um, so again, really father and your family. cousin. It sounds like you put out a call to your 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 family at some point. They've they, yeah, they've fallen into it. Um, <laughs> you know, all, all the people who contributed to the blog as well over over the years, um, and very much all the people I've pestered, frankly, some in uh, you know Vicky Stretch, the Network Rail archivist, um, Alison Grain, Shannon O'Neill, head of Steam. I could reel off real off whole whole list of names from people. I won't do it. As I say, thank you very much. You know who you are. We are grateful. Um, colleagues at the NRM Portsmouth. Um, within the family history community, um, you know, it's, this couldn't be done without them. And within the rail industry, um, which I might just pause on for a second, if I may, um, just again, thinking a bit about the people who have experience, who work or work in the industry, um, like Greg Morse, uh, RSSB, Paul Wilkinson at ORR, the Office of Rail and Road, um, those who get involved, Gareth, I know you're out there somewhere. Thank you very much. Your insight and contributions have been very helpful and your responses and support. Um, Gary Stratton, Grant Murchie, many more. Uh, it's It really is very, very helpful. Um, so maybe, maybe I can convince one of my students to do a dissertation using the... I would absolutely love that. And you know, that, this is it. what's been nice is that some of my students down at Portsmouth have made use of the, the data and the material. Hmm. Um, so it's been really interesting working with them on it and that's one of them you know, there's no point in having this doing this and the volunteers doing everything that they are doing if people don't know about it or aren't using it so absolutely heartfelt plea to everybody who's listening tell your friends and family make use of this um it's a huge resource it's there for you yeah so yes zip on sorry i'm aware that time time is, is yes on. but not not to worry not to worry you would say that's that's your your breakdown of yeah, so again, it's just it's just worth saying that there's it is we wanted it to be and we designed it to be and hoped it would be for as many people as possible. Clearly, it should have interest and relevance for people who are interested in railways in whatever capacity as historians, enthusiasts within the current industry. Um, and again, on that one, you know, it's it's been very interesting talking with uh, those that I've had contact with in Network Rail. Um, the rail accident investigation branch uh, and having had the support of the Office of Rail and Road who lent us a number of the um, Ministry of Transport volumes uh, from the 1920s and 1930s so that we could scan them and make use of them. Um, you know, absolutely fantastic they're willing to do that uh, and again kind of very much demonstrating that something that's very interesting something that Gareth mentioned last in last week's uh, Transport Tavern um, about this idea about corporate memory loss and like yeah absolutely there's no doubt about that that over again particularly recent years that's happened but 
within the LRR, you know, they've got the volumes of these things going back to the 1840s uh, for the passenger accident reports, going back to 1900 for the, the worker accident reports. And they, they do draw on them. That's fantastically important and kind of heartening as well. Um, so that's, that's, that is there. There's a question which we might come back to, I don't know, about how far what we're doing, we're stopping in 1939, is relevant to the industry now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an open question, it's a challenge. Uh, I think it is, but we need to think carefully about that, what's going on. You know, there are huge changes in the industry, so it's for all sorts of reasons. There's, the, um, there's a, sort of a, a sort of sense that it's also not necessarily about, should we say, the day-to-day, -day. it's about how do organizations learn how do they develop capabilities and understandings regulations a sort of more theoretical point there that could be perhaps taken away yeah and i think it's on that sort of level it might this what we do might be useful again I, you know i nod to greg morse on this one but when i initially started talking with him about this um he said well actually you know, the, there could be a really interesting way that this sort of material could be useful in the industry now is it provides uh, in inverted commas a, a kind of a safe example that you can use to discuss bad practice. Um, you can say, "Well, look, this has happened. We got this accident report. Uh, should this have happened? Who was? Uh, what were the conditions that led to this happening? How might we stop it from happening again?" And because it doesn't mention a current company or any current individuals, it becomes easy to have a frank conversation about what went on and what what would be different now as well so kind of a, a starting point potentially um which i'd like to think you know there, there's potential there for um you know academics all sorts of interested museums archives one of the great hopes of, of the collaborating institutions so particularly the national railway museum but also modern record center is that it will give people better access and and the national archives of course better access um to the material but for the nrm uh, it can feed into their display work, um, so that in interpretation and so on. So, you know, this whole sort of uh, links there that we're hoping and are actively promoting and trying for. Um, the only thing I'd, if the kind of final point I'd say, local historians, family historians, I've already mentioned how brilliant the family historians have been and are being uh, and how interested they are. There's a, been a lot of kind of perceived snobbery over the years certainly from within the academic community to what family historians and to some degree local historians are doing um oh they're just chasing names it's, it's all about who begat who well that's certainly not the case uh and i suspect has not been the case for at least a very long time if ever um, i go to but, local i lecture occasionally to local historian groups and family historian groups and i find well, sometimes you find those different objectives. They are exceedingly knowledgeable, exceedingly friendly, willing to share. It's not just chasing names. It's a deep no. well of knowledge that can be used. And yeah, I have yet to find people of a better mastery of sources and family historians. Um, and I, I say that as a you know as a, as a professional historian that the, the what they're able to pull from and what sometimes get out of the sources is really phenomenal um and it's again been very heartening exactly that 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 collaborative endeavor and that sharing um the fact that it is a two-way street i'm learning from from them hopefully they are learning from what we're doing um one of the kind of interesting things that, that a number of of people have been doing i mentioned jackie de Pelle earlier people like nick barrett who is a kind of he's an academic as well as a family historian um, Laura King, uh, academic historian up at Leeds, Tanya Evans, another academic historian at um, Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. You know, all sorts of people have been working on, um, those, uh, colleagues from within the British Association for Local History, uh, from within the British Library, we're trying to pull together this idea that, exactly, David, as you say, we're all historians, we're all researchers looking into these topics sometimes in different ways, sometimes with different objectives, but we're all interested in fundamentally in the past. Um, so we should be able to work together in a more collaborative way, a more useful way. Uh, so we tried to come together as uh, historians collaborate. Uh, kind of, I don't know what, I'm not sure I'd describe this as a movement, um, but as try and find, kind of basically find that common ground, a, me a meeting point so we can work together better. So hence the historianscollaborate.com down there. Um, it's a very much a, a shell site at the moment, it gives us a bit of idea of, of what we want to try and do. There were going to be plans, 
one of one of the, our number, Julia Late, had some funding from the British Academy to pull together a series of, of workshops to try and explore those links. Obviously now postponed with COVID, so that will be happening at some point whenever um, uh, and however, I don't know, but there are plans still to do it to try and kind of really get into to grips with this. So that's that's the kind of the pitch. Be aware of that. Let's go on. Yes. Oh, Mr. Snow. Mr. Snow, yes. So I've talked in kind of quite abstract terms in some respects, and I've got a whole sheaf of examples, which I'm not going to give because I'm conscious of time, except, of course, if people do want them, I'm very happy to talk. Um, but um, Joseph Snow, what's, again, nice about this, the cases where we, we see the person, we've got the portrait in this case. So we know a bit about from his accident report um, from the Board of Trade, about his accident. So 3rd of February 1911, uh, uh, he just clocked off 4.35 a.m. Um, he was a goods guard uh, at Temple Mills on the Great Eastern. Uh, fantastically complex uh, a ra track arrangement, as we shall see in a moment. Uh, there was, as he's walking off, off site, uh, along the prescribed route, um, along some wooden covers, um, there was a shunting move going on. Um, and again, the report's quite useful in the sense that it details, does detail reasonably precisely that that movement, what was going on, the, the pushback from the sidings into the shunting spur and so on. And then the next thing that the report details, because again, it's kind of quite a factual account, is that uh, Snow's body was found uh, at the, uh, the shunting neck uh, and he'd clearly been run over by a wagon um, and it, the wagon was derailed. The... Invest, the accident investigator, um, uh, Armitage, John, John Armitage, I think, um, uh, had a look at the site. Uh, he couldn't find any reason why, any physical reason why the wagon might have de derailed. So he kind of he said, well, there's some suggestion that some of the buffers might have locked in the siding and uh, eventually forcing the derailment as, as they were moved. But there's, there's no hard and fast. And he thought it was more likely that Snow had, had simply slipped on the planking fallen under the wagon and then caused the derailment. Um, you know, rather, well, very un grisly way to go, no doubt. But, you know, there's uncertainty about what actually happened. What's useful about this is that then, kind of, you get the report. We've got this image from the Great Eastern Railway magazine. If we flick on to the next slide, again, not, not a brilliant map in a sense, because I didn't want to go too detailed, but the National Library of Scotland, for anyone, the maps, all if anyone hasn't yet used it it's amazing hours of yeah. absorption yeah it comes with a health warning and that uh, you'll lose time on it um good portions just looking at the they've digitized pretty much well, all the ordnance survey maps they have for the whole of um scotland wales and england they haven't got complete coverage um but they've got really good coverage so hence we're able to get just give you a snapshot of what temple mills looked like in uh, i forget when this was the 1890s bit early to early 19th century ones yes yeah it would have been around that neck of the woods so it's close to the accident the time of the accident as i could get um so again yeah, you can see the complexity of the track work here what's going on but we start to pin together that picture there um and if you go on to the next slide please David. What's really helpful then is, of course, the uh, adding in the newspaper reports. Um, again, I'm sure most people who are looking into this sort of uh, any sort of material, the newspapers are fantastic. Local newspapers, absolutely brilliant at giving us even some detail. So in this one, we get something we didn't have before. Uh, one thing at least. Uh, uh, again, his age, Joseph Snow, 24. So we know his well, and his first name. So we know his first name and his age. And we get a bit more detail about what may or may not have happened. Um, so what I like about what we're doing is it's it's great in its own right, hopefully, uh, but also it's enabling people to kind of pin stuff together uh, using other sources. And, and it's quite useful, again, then. It, it gives us all sorts of insight into loads of other factors that were at play within the railway workforce. Um, so disability at work. We've got a number of cases where we had uh, permanent way staff who were hard of hearing or deaf, um, but still at work on the lines. Um, so one case, uh, James Coughlin 
uh, was at work um, between uh, Bury and Bolton in November 1914, was given warning of the approach to a train, very, very late warning, jumped off out the way and uh, unfortunately jumped the wrong way and into the path of the train, um, the, the oncoming engine. Um, again, it, that's where a really interesting one because it kind of it ties into all sorts of debates that were happening at the time about the uh, whether you needed a lookout man or not um, uh, on the on the tracks there with them. They didn't have one. And the inspector, the accident investigator said, oh, he didn't really need one. He just needed to take ordinary care. Like, he was deaf. Um, how could he possibly have heard the warning? He had to see a, a visual warning. Um, but yes, it's perfectly acceptable for a, uh, someone who's deaf to work in this environment. I mean, it's kind of mind boggling. So also, another kind of really interesting factor about that case was that um, Coffin was illiterate. And the service that hit him was a race special that wasn't in the timetables, even the working timetables. Um, but they'd been given written notice that morning of the service, but of course he couldn't read it. Um, so, you know, it's, there's kind of there's these amazing details that we get from the reports in there. Um, David, I'm conscious that we're at eight o'clock. Uh, what... We've got, we can carry on for another 10, 15. If... If if you're willing, then I'd I'd love to. Yeah. Um. So again, just to kind of the the illustration of the detail in there. There's there's it says there's great stuff in there about uh, gender on the railways as well. Unsurprisingly, most of the cases in the database so far have been men. Um, there have been a few women. Um, but we can do a bit of kind of work on that and say, well, actually, statistically, even so, the three women that feature in the three thousand nine hundred twenty odd cases. In the initial data set, uh, is still prob still an underrepresentation with the number of women that were in the workforce at this time, around thirteen thousand. Um, but what roles were they in? Well, they were in roles that were probably less likely to be exposed to danger because of kind of the norms of the time about what's appropriate work for women. So, again, it's really interesting interesting things in there uh, that we can kind of pull out if we think about it. Um, I won't, I'll spare you the really kind of, there's a really nice detailed uh, operational one, um, which I won't go into, because um, I do want to push on and just say a couple more things, if that's all right. Um, we've got, um, we just got a point about this story uh, from Gordon mm -hmm. saying, it's interesting how the jury found against the GER. Yeah, so uh, for what that would have, whatever that would have meant. So one of the things I didn't say was that the, the companies were still really quite powerful at this time. The power was definitely waning, but the the kind of informal power they were able to exercise over both their own staff and in other circumstances, uh, other bits of the, the agencies involved were still there. So the rider, you know, if a jury adds a, a rider following a, a coroner's inquest, you know, it says, well, basically, yeah, they can find someone responsible. But as I understand it, you know, the purpose of an inquest is to, it's a, it's not a legal thing in terms of finding out who's responsible for prosecution. It's a, 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 just a, a kind of a purely factual discovery of well, what, what happened, who was responsible. Um, and I understand it was not supposed to prejudice any further proceedings. Um, how it couldn't have done, I don't know. I'm not sure about it. So I, I, I don't know enough about inquests other than they're fantastically useful when they're, the report's feature in newspapers so that we get some detail and sometimes um, testimony as well which is one of the things that our source space lacks is much of the, the workers voices themselves you know we're dealing with official records whether it's the state whether it's the companies whether it's the unions so when we start to get the coroner's inquests we get at least the colleagues voices coming through um, so yeah finding against a company it's it's still a big step um, and in some in some some cases, you see in the um, the board of trade, the inspectors and the Ministry of Transport inspectors reports, they find against the companies. It's quite unusual, admittedly, but they do find against the companies and express in sometimes in quite strong terms the company is at fault. They must do this to change it. The only problem is that they don't have any power. The board of trade don't have any power. They can make recommendations, but they can't force the companies to do anything about it. So, the same they have with a sort of passenger stage back to the 1840s, isn't it? They they they, they were yeah. make recommendations, but that's all they could do. Exactly, and that's you know that's a real bind, and you, you can see it. One of the blog posts we've got looked at 
uh, a series of accidents that took place in Mansfield Tunnel in Nottingham. Uh, it was known to be a particularly smoky tunnel. There was because it was built. It was the line that was built so late that it was ploughing underneath uh, well-established town. They they couldn't get any ventilation, so it's known to be a particularly dangerous uh, tunnel for the PW staff to work in. Um, and they had a string of accidents in there in a spate of two or three years. And the, you can see the frustration in the final report of the run of four reports of or in the, the data. Because uh, uh, the inspector basically says, I've told you about this already. We've we've had these cases on these three previous occasions, plus another fatality that we didn't investigate. Um, you've got to sort this out. But the company, you know, clearly they haven't in the past. And all right, in that case, there may be practical difficulties. Uh, in other cases, you know, something that Gareth mentioned last week, actually, you know, about the economics of it. Um, he was talking about the, the uh, Newark Flat Crossing. You know, there it's a, it's a cost decision at the time to make to do it in that way with with the accident employee accidents very often it's a cost decision uh because it costs money to employ more staff it costs money to change a system of work to employ uh, to to use personal protective equipment machine guards or whatever it may be um so the, you know the, there are decisions and the companies are declining profit profitability at this point so i mean they they, 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 they make especially I think with passenger safety, they make a, an unbalanced decision between how much can we almost get away with in terms of not installing safety uh, and our public yeah. appearance, how, how will that play? You know, there's a, an, you know, they're, they're going for some balance there if they can. With, so the, then this is where the passengers get it good in some respects, because you know, the, the guiding, one of the guiding principles of border trade in terms of publishing uh, certainly passenger accident reports from the 1840s was very much that they would the publication of these reports would force the companies to change because they would be seen to be dangerous companies no one would want to be seen to be that so they would voluntarily improve uh, but you don't have that same impetus with the pass uh, the, sorry the worker reports and the worker investigations because although they are published and made publicly available they're not spectacular who's going to read these, these things there's so many of them um, so Kind of they don't get that same impetus in terms of the here's a recommendation or we better do it for the companies for our for our PR. Uh, so same with yeah. like publishing statistics of length of block working. There there is a a very that that is seen as a very well an effective mechanism. But that, yeah, as you say, it doesn't seem to come through with the the worker safety. Definitely not. Definitely not. And, I am. One of the, I have a good. Bruno says, please keep going. Fascinating. More examples, please. So you know. Oh, yeah. Right, well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Thank you. That's good. I'll, I'll save the. As I say, I'll still save the really long. So I'd, I'd rather kind of go to a couple of small ones. One of the ones I just wanted to mention was one of the really nice things that's coming out of, of this is that we're starting now. What we're looking at is always a subset of the population, and it's it's it is the grades by and large that are more exposed to danger. So the manual grades that we find in these reports. Um, and there's a lot of, of PW accidents in there. Um, again, when something goes wrong there, it does tend to be fairly catastrophic because you're going to be hit by a train. Um, one of the things we see is uh, where individuals have more than one accident. So in our initial data run, uh, initial data set, we've got, um, I think it's 10 or 12 cases where staff had uh, two accidents. Uh, Tom, I know at the, the National Archives team has found a case uh, where I think there were three or four accidents that one individual had um, for, I think, yeah, exactly. It's amazing. And you kind of keep, I don't want to say keep coming back for more, but yeah, it's, it's a bit worrying. One of the ones I wanted that kind of really stood out um, was uh, a case, uh, Joseph Brown in 1912. Uh, again, on the Great Eastern, I see there seems to be a heavy Great Eastern focus on this one, which is perhaps is, is definitely unfair. Um, but the, again, it's just one of those things that it, it cropped up that um, he was a permanent way labourer. And in February 1912, he was hit by a train and injured, uh, probably not badly by the sounds of things, although no one really wants to be hit by a train, um, whilst at work. Um, somewhere not far out of Liverpool Street Station. Uh, he was back at, I say he wasn't injured badly because he was back at work three weeks later and we know he's back at work three weeks later because he's the very next accident report in that volume. Uh, he's hit by another train, um, similar sort of location as well and again survives. So he's both the kind of the unluckiest permanent wayman 
uh, being hit twice by engines in uh, three weeks, but also the luckiest because he survives both times and seems to get away relatively unscathed. Um, but again, we get this kind of this insight into uh, the the ways in which people have accidents, how they have them, and if they have them more than you know more than one accident. Um, can I? Can we go on to the next slide? Thanks. So there's a kind of uh, this is interesting, but there's a, a, a health warning with it. And again, we're absolute numbers here, so it, it doesn't tell us about how th these accidents were relative to the population. So how many 14 to 19 year olds were employed on the railways at this time? So definitely needs more analysis. Um, but it's indicative, and it's it's interesting that we see kind of where some sort of accidents took place at the distribution but also that age range so from 14 um actually the youngest accident in the database i think now is age 10 um oh, uh, again it's a non-employee we've got mostly employees in the, in the database but there are people who had reason to be around the railways um so farmers crossing the lines um uh coal merchants draymen taking deliveries to and from um and uh, post office workers as well uh who had collected mail and so on so all sorts of reasons why so uh 14 year olds and i'll come back to a young case in a moment but at the other end of the spectrum um look at this this bottom category so the 70 to 78 bracket the 78 year old was a farmer crossing the line um so unusual the next the next oldest person uh was 75 uh chap called david Sheer. Um, a ganger killed in 1912 at Stewart in Ayrshire. Imagine being a permanent way ganger at age 75. Um, it's, it's, again, just kind of incredible and a reminder of how different life was at a time when things like old age pensions were just, just being thwarted. Quite, quite common. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it is really interesting, just a kind of stark reminder of how hard life could be uh, for, for anyone at this point, but obviously with a railway focus on this one. Um, I mentioned the, the young end of the spectrum. Again, it's hard not to not to find the younger cases sad and again i know there's all sorts of things here kind of about the societal value that we place on youth and so on and uh, again i've i felt this particularly in in recent years as as a father um but the, sometimes the younger ones one cases get to you um and in this case the one case that came across fairly early in the thing is um, james beck who was was 16 um a wagon greaser um so greasing the axle boxes making sure that the the wagons aren't going to run hot so uh, and they're going to run smoothly and efficiently um so his job was to walk along beside the goods trains and make sure that the wagons are topped up with with grease or oil as the case may be um july 1914 he's working up in uh shawfield in glasgow and he's hit by a train and killed um you know it's that's hard to think about the best of times the kind of almost hard nosedness of the the accident investigation report from the board of trade inspector charles campbell his finding was it was want of care on the part of beck who i'm assured had been specially warned to beware of trains uh, when he's walking between the lines like well that's clearly gonna gonna sort this out isn't it look out for the trains um not thinking about why someone is working in this environment and particularly someone of that age is working in this environment and relatively limited experience potentially uh it's just a kind of natural part of the job it's, it's what you have to do for the job um and again this idea that employees learn the danger of the job as they go and get you judging an appropriate yeah yeah attention so it's quite challenging um what's really interesting about this case if we go on to the next the next slide I know you're a big fan of book, such booklets, aren't you? Mark? I am. I had to. I kind of. I wanted to sneak one of these in because it wasn't really the main focus of this. And you know, if, if at some point the the time and interest uh, is there, I and you have me back, I'll come back and talk about these sorts of things because there's a particular. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to say about them. But oh, eBay, I think is the first one. Uh, yes. Yeah. Dangerous, <laughs> another dangerous place. Um, so this was uh, the Vigilance booklet issued in 1921 by the Caledonian. 
uh, one of a number of similar sorts of booklets. By the time you get into the grouping era, all of the companies are issuing this sort of material. Um, so it's kind of it becomes industry standard in some respect. Um, illustrated booklets go written in a friendly way, telling workers how to avoid accidents. Um, started by the Great Western in 1913, first booklet in 1914. So the safety movement, wasn't it? The safety movement, indeed. Uh, well, haven't you? I bet. I, I'm, I'm afraid I have a subject of my PhD research and some other bits and pieces that I've done over the years. Um, what's really interesting about this one is that you can see a transition, a kind of a, a case where Beck's case makes it into this booklet, even though it's several years later. But the, the, I know it's a little hard to read, but the top example on the, the extract that I've given, a greaser was walking in a six foot way along with his wagon and examiner when the driver of an empty carriage train approaching behind sounded the whistle uh, and so on. So that's, I'm 99% certain that that is Beck's case. Um, just again, the details that are in the accident report, the state accident report, and appear here. And you see this in the, it's a bit easier in the Great Western's booklet case. You know, there are some cases where I've been very clearly able to translate between the Great Western's records and the records that they use in the um, uh, in their booklet. So again, this idea of kind of the afterlife of the accident that it's being used in a particular way uh, as a, a warning to others is undoubtedly very sad. Um, but again, really interesting that what the industry is doing at this time. Um, and how so, the companies themselves sort of keep a keep a log of these things. Absolutely, it, it, it's 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 moved into a, a some degree corporate memory. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And again, the what the companies are doing. I mean, legally they have to document these accidents and send notice in to the board of trade. So there's where those records have survived and these are the ones that are held at, at Kew um, at the National Archives they're fantastically useful they there's been a big cluster that survived for South Wales um, and a few other companies as well so it's uh, you know it is again it's always incomplete coverage but it's really useful in the sense of you get some level of, of detail about what went on but also you get that kind of that sense of well what was the industry doing it did take you know it was aware of the accident problem uh, if, if only by numbers and the amount of compensation it's paying out. Um, we uh, Another time I'll say something about how effective I think these sorts of things were, but that's that's not for now. Um, if we, yeah, if we shuffle on. So what's, what does the future hold? Hopefully, lots of things. Um, at the moment, we've got about 6,500 cases in the, uh, that's publicly available in the database. Uh, we're working on cleaning an immense amount of data that we've had in from the team at the um, National Railway Museum. So the interwar period, they've covered about 9,000 cases there, I think. Um, the team at the um, Modern Record Center, again, I couldn't estimate the number of cases that we're working on cleaning at the moment because there are, again, thousands of them in there. And likewise, those uh, we're working with at the National Archives are doing brilliantly and they've been working so hard and so fast it's been impossible to keep up with them um, but again thousands of records come in from them so over the coming years we are going to be increasing massively we reckon um, so these are the things I'm saying here the state reports um, the NUR cases and the railway company records we reckon there are probably about 70,000 more cases to come um, so records improve as you go forward in time um they yeah good question i don't think they do actually i think they're remarkably standard um there's a the the, the only one that really changes are the ones that really change are the asrs nur cases you get different sorts of detail and you do get a bit more detail as you go on um otherwise the state reports it's a standard format which is really useful for us in terms of getting the data into the database and made public and likewise, the railway company records, it's basically a standard-ish format. Um, and that, that seems to be fairly consistent. I suspect it's been driven by the state's, um, the state's reporting requirements. So there's a standard way in which these things are being recorded because they've got to feed it into the state. Um, so, yeah, the, the, yeah there's, there's a lot that the volunteer team are working on, volunteer teams are working on. Um, uh, the... What I would 
add in on this one is that the what we're trying to do when when the archives reopen because this is now the problem of course uh because of, of covid um that the records are, are locked up so we can't get access to them um so i'm, I'm grateful to all the volunteers who've been carrying on doing what they can remotely uh, particularly for the modern record center the trade union archives there um we're hoping that we're going to be able to um photograph and make available the act uh, reports uh, the data remotely so if anybody is interested here's my plea peace to camera um <laughs> uh, if anybody minute, is interested in getting involved Mike, Mike. Sorry, David? do it now do it now we've got the <laughs> well, that's the one thank you very much right um this is a message to you all out there uh for if anyone is interested in what we're doing and fancy getting involved um do please get in touch with us via the, the various project details the project routes um We'd love to hear from you. Uh, it's not going to be for some time yet before we can do anything anyway. Uh, you know, everyone's overloaded at the moment with what's going on and we haven't got access to the records, but we are always interested in, in more people getting involved and particularly knowledgeable people getting involved. And, and I say that in you know, whichever kind of knowledge is you bring to it. Um, what we'd like to do is make those records uh, available digitally so that you can get get access to them, transcribe them, and bring them into the, the data set. So, yeah, drop us a line, is what I'd say on that one. Um, if we whiz back to the slide briefly, um, the future wish list, oh. doing the sorts of stuff that, that I've um, mentioned already, which is um, uh, kind of user contributions. So what we think, kind of hearing from people, so particularly the family history crowd have been brilliant at saying, oh, you know, here's my grandfather's accent, or this is my great-grandfather, or whatever it was, whoever it was, and uh, being able to bring some of that in would be wonderful. Um, uh, so questions to questions to the audience. Um, where should we be spreading the word about what we're doing? Um, and we're interested in what questions, what questions do you have? So again, do, do let us know, please, now or, or later. We'd love to hear. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we're interested in, uh, again, think about kind of try how we can be collaborative at the moment, always. Uh, guest blog, blog posts. Um, we're trying to keep it still a weekly blog. Um, and as I say about the trade union data, um, hopefully getting involved in that. Beyond that, that's me done. Sorry, it's been a no, bit... No, it's uh, fine. Lots of stuff. Thank you so well, much, Mike. That was really interesting. I hope, I hope everybody does engage with this it's a wonderful wonderful project um i'm following it as uh, you know between things and i really want to see if, how i can use it on on the course and see how we can you know utilize it it's just a fantastic resource so i encourage everybody to dive in in one way or the other another thanks david That's so it. um right so what have we got coming in next week well next week we've got uh, my colleague and uh, Lynn is uh, a member of the management school team and she's going to be talking about the privatisation process of British Rail and particularly about an oral history project that is running at the National Rail or in collaboration with National Railway Museum uh, to document uh, railway officials, mm -hmm. railway workers' experiences of privatization and muddling or organizing through that so that's that's next time and i will say of course we're still recruiting for the ma in railway history three years part-time and uh mike what do you think of that particular course uh i'm well i'm I, yeah what can i say as the external examiner um <laughs> i've been i've if it's not saying anything too much you know i've been impressed by what i've seen so far that the students have been producing um so and i'm looking forward to carrying on to read the work that they're producing it's a sorry mike i put you on the spot there a little um <laughs> but uh it's still we're still recruiting three years uh online and uh it's we've got you know we've got limited spaces we're filling up for next year but keep it in mind if it's something you might like to do in the future and uh so i if you want to buy me a coffee and i'll i'll pass pass that coffee on to the guest uh we are you know i have a coffee page and all that that remains to be seen is thank you very much mike for coming on and thank you all for joining us and thank you for 
you know, just being here and commenting. And, uh, yeah, do join us next week. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.